Welcome to season 11 of the Parenting Aces podcast, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week we are going to be talking with Nick Bonacor about the Reform Sports Project and the role of parents in this whole youth sports developmental journey that we're, we all are going through. Nick is a former Division III baseball player, won a national championship while at North Carolina Wesleyan, and is is now a dad himself, a sports parent himself, and a podcaster himself. So once again, I find myself on the other side of the mic from a fellow podcaster, which is going to be super fun. And I'm really thrilled to bring you all this conversation with Nick and to talk about and really dig into what the role of the parent is as we all are committed to helping our children have the best possible experience in childhood and in sports and in school and everything else that comes with it. Before I bring Nick on, though, I just want to give you all a quick reminder. If you haven't become a premium member of Parenting Aces yet, we would love for you to join our community. In addition to having full access to all of our articles and podcasts and special events, you also get two complimentary one-hour consults with me, and I love those calls. I love hopping on Zoom with y'all and getting to hear about the challenges that you're facing and maybe talk through those challenges and help you find some workable solutions for your family. Also, just a quick reminder, we've got so much new content on the site. So I hope that you're checking the site, checking our Facebook page and Facebook groups, following us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel so you can watch the video version of all of our podcasts as well. So for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode with Nick Bonacor. Hey, Nick, thanks so much for joining us on the Parenting Aces podcast. We have been communicating via Twitter for a while now. I've been following you for a long time, and I'm just so excited to get to chat with you. Thank you for having me, Lisa. I really appreciate it. I'm humbled that you offered me the opportunity and asked me to come on. I'm flattered. Very excited. So thank you. Well, we're going to start by talking about the Reform Sports Project because this is something you started after noticing a need in the the arena of youth sports. And you played collegiate sports and you won a national championship. You're now a dad. You coach. So you kind of come at this whole youth sports thing from all the angles and have a unique perspective. Well, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, as far as, <clears throat> you know, why I started the Reform Sports Project, first of all, I guess you got to, where did the name Reform come from, right? And, uh, you know, I know from for me, the word Reform came from because I thought, I realized probably about five, six, seven years ago, somewhere in that ballpark, that I was probably getting a little bit too overzealous uh, with regards to my involvement or my enthusiasm for my kids sports, right? Let's call it enthusiasm. I love um, your word choices. Yeah, enthusiasm, right? Because listen, there's nothing wrong with being yeah. an excited parent, passion, all that. But listen, when I was coaching my kids, and it, especially in youth baseball uh, and football, two sports I played, um, you know, I can t- put it this way. I started getting really full of myself when I saw my kids and my teams do really well. You know, and I might not it have feels ex- good. it does, but at the same time, I had some, um, I started to just notice, and I think it was the older my kids got and, and taking notice of the way other parents started acting. I started hearing a lot of people talk about, um, college sports when their kids are like nine and 10 and like getting recruited. And I was like, well, it's a little odd, you know, but, um, it's easy to get wrapped up, wrapped up in it. And quite mm-hmm. frankly, I saw how people were doing so. I also <laughs> heard a lot of folks talking. And when I say folks, I mean, people that run organizations. Mm-hmm. And I thought they were giving information that wasn't the right information. I thought I, I heard a lot of people uh, recommending uh, at, at very young ages. Again, I'll, I'm going to stick with baseball because that's what I'm talking about. Is I hear people saying, you know, in order for your kids to go play college sports, they got to play all year round. You know, there's really no time to play other things. They got to specialize. And I'm sitting here going, well, 
I don't think that that's not true. Like the best athletes I ever played with in my life who actually became big leaguers and got drafted and such. They were like, they were athletes. They, especially at really young ages. Now, as you get older into high school, I can understand that, you know, you know, if you want to lock in a little bit, but there's no one path, you know, and I heard this kind of sales pitch and, and it kind of really made me take a look and, and step back and go, wow, there's a, there's very different perspectives out there. And a lot of these people who don't have much experience, I think are being led down the wrong path. And I, and I, I felt like, there was a lot of fear of missing out being sold. And I kind of, once I almost saw that, you know, people that really didn't know they're being told their kids at seven, eight, nine are the special talent, which they may or may not be. But once a parent hears that, I think it's very easy to get them to kind of do what you want, yeah. you know, and, and, not, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with like, Hey, listen, your kid has talent. If you focus it, but I just feel like it could be easily manipulated. And I felt like there was no voice out there really uh giving another perspective and, and i felt moved to create reform sports project that's that's really what it came down to well let's talk about the impact that has on the child you know sure. first of all the parents as you mentioned you know the fomo is absolutely real you hear of you know this child doing this thing and this family traveling to you know this country for their kid to train and i mean in tennis it's you know i'm sure very similar to what you see in baseball but yep. what does that do to the child? You know, my, my older sons wrestle. So it's an individual sport, right? I mean, there's a team element to it, but I would say comparable. It's got to be somewhat of a same element. You're out there one-on-one, -on -one, like in tennis. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the same type of thing. You know, it's, it's, there's these big national tournaments um, taking place all over the country. And, you know, how does that make the kid feel? I think there are situations because I've met a lot of I've met a lot of different types of people through the sport of wrestling, some whose kids are very much entrenched in that national travel kind of circuit at a very young age. Uh, I've seen those folks that are very balanced in that, you know, mm -hmm. where they really take a, a, a an approach of, you know, my kids, you know, the kids want to drive this if they want time off, they can. And then I see the other side you know, where really it's being led, you know, by the parents and, you know, we're going to cut weight, you know, you got to get down, you know, here's a, a 12 year, a 12 year old, you know, we got to suck 10 extra pounds to get down to this weight because we're going to go to, you know, super 32, which is a big tournament, uh, a national term. We got to go there. Cause we got to, we got to be the best that we can at 10 or 11 or 12. And I think that kids can become, I shouldn't say, I think kids can become um, confused and confused by what their parents value. Um, and they can take a, a situation where they start to think that their parents care and love for them is tied to their performance in their particular sport. Exactly. Um, I think it's very easy for that to happen. And one of the, I've heard, and I, as you know, we, you know, we have the podcast and I interview, I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of coach coaches and athletes and, one of the biggest things you hear people say is, you know, when especially coaches at the highest levels, they have a tendency to go to their kids games and they sit quietly or they they cheer moderately and they cheer for each kid and they don't get overly excited when their kid does well. And they don't say really anything when their kid does bad because it's, you know, are you putting forth the effort? Are you putting forth right. um, the controllables? Right. Because performance it's so, how do we, you can try your hardest and lose, right? You could try your hardest and not have it that day. You can't really, sometimes you run into someone who's much better than you. So I think it, it, when it comes to the kids, if they see their parents over, over stimulated, over involved and over driven by results, I think it adds a, a hell of a lot of pressure, especially at those young ages. And, and it's easy to be misconstrued, I think, as, as tying your worth to your performance. Absolutely. And you said something a couple minutes ago, we're doing this, we're going to this tournament, we're playing this event. And to me, that's a huge red flag when the parent starts using the we instead of you, the child are going to play this event, you, the child need to go work on this, you know, it's, there's no we about it, we the parents are driving them. Yes, we are funding their effort. We are supporting them, but mm -hmm. we're not the ones out there doing the actual training and competing. That's on the kid. And I think we have to have that separation. 
Well, it's a hundred percent on the kid. Um, and one of the, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that it's one of the simple questions. Like, do you really want to do this? Is it, you know, are, are you, are you interested in going to this tournament? Um, is this something that you want to train for? Uh, is this something that you really want to be involved with? Do you want to take a break? And I think it's gauging, you know, I'll give you an idea is my, my, this is like so fresh in our, in our, what's going on in our life. So my oldest son recently committed uh, to the North Car University of North Carolina, Pembroke. It's a, it's a really good division two program. He's in a wrestle there. Uh, he's, he just finished his junior year wrestling, but you know, he's always been pretty good, you know, pretty good. He finished state runner up this year and, and, and he's a two-time placer, but, and he's always been good. Even when he was in youth, you know, he's at least around the state of North Carolina, one of the better wrestlers. And there was a couple of years ago, I said to him, I think he was a freshman because he's a junior now. Um, I said to him, Avery, dude, you know, you work, he works really hard when he's at practice. He, he, he really does. But, but then he wasn't doing any work outside of it. Right. So he really wouldn't do any work on his own. Um, not that much at all. And I'd say to him, like I said to him, I'll never forget. I say, Avery, do you, you know, you say you want to win and you want to go to college. You want to be a champ, but like, you don't really do much like some of these other kids do who are, who are beating you. And he goes, dad, you know, I don't really feel the need to do that right now. I, I, I you know, I'm getting by the way that I am and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And until I feel the need to do it, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And, and in my mind, I wanted to go, dude, that's like the word, like, come on, man. I really did. But I didn't. And I said to my wife that he just told me that and, and I'm going to leave him alone. Well, what happens? This year, he lost. He lost four mat. He lost six matches total. Four of them were. He only lost four matches in the state of North Carolina. Two of the other losses he had were champion of Virginia and a champion in South Carolina. the The four losses he had in North Carolina were all to the same kid. And what happened? That kid was a state champ, and my son lost. Avery lost to him in the in the in the finals. And finally, he was so happy he made it to the finals. But then when he got there, he was like, "I'm going to beat him now." The bottom line is after he lost the next day, he made his commitment. He goes, dad, I'm never going to like, I'm, I'm, I'm officially like going to start doing more work. Like if I can get to this point doing the work I was, imagine what happens if I actually lift all year or I do these things that he knows he should have been doing. So it happened. You know what I mean? I, I would, that would his now that's what he's been doing now. He's so focused on it. It's intrinsic, right? It's coming from his experience. Had I prevented him two years ago or, or, or hovered over him or told him, Hey, you know, you got to do extra work. I probably would have wore him down. Right. You know, I really would have warmed down mentally. I might've burnt him out and I'm, he might've just rebelled, but because it's coming from within him now, it means so much more. So that, that's like the freshest, freshest example I could say of like, Hey, it's not we, right. It's, I can help lead you, but at the end of the day, it's their journey. It's his right. journey. Absolutely. And I mean, good for you for resisting the urge because that's so difficult. I mean, I was in that situation multiple times too. And sometimes I handled it well, but most of the time I handled it really poorly. And you're absolutely right. If you can take a step back and allow your child to get to the place where they have the emotional maturity to understand what they need to do, and then have the desire to achieve that next level and the willingness to put the work in to get there, that's a win all around because they've learned a valuable lesson. We've learned valuable lessons as their parents by allowing them to come to this on their own. And I'm sure you will vouch for this. It is such a moment of pride as a parent to see your child get to that place where they recognize what they need to do and they commit to it on their own without nudging from us or nudging from a coach. Well, and, and I think that's the goal as a parent, right? Like my, my goal, <clears throat> people, you know, talk about, wow, my kids going here. My, my goal as a parent is like, my wife and I talk about this. It's like, I want our kids to be good, good citizens. You know, I want them to be good. Like if we look at the big picture of it, like what do I want my kid to be? Like the, the best high school athlete or college athlete? And then what? Like, is that all yeah. they're valued? Like, no, I want them to be, you know, good husbands. I have a daughter, a good wife, uh, uh, or maybe not. Like if that's not their path, but like good, productive human beings who are self-sufficient, 
you know, who are, are able to take care of themselves. To me, that's what I would consider and what I consider to be the win of wins. And the only way that my kids are going to learn how to do that is by quite frankly, falling on their face, yeah. you know, um, falling on their face, scraping their knees, learning. It's okay to, you know, to, they, they need to feel free and safe to fail. And I got it. You, you just, you kind of nailed it. It doesn't feel good to watch your kids struggle, I, especially, you know, I'm a type a, you know, I want to wrap my arms around situations. You know what I mean? I want to try to control them. But all I know, and I've learned this, that's why it's called the Reform Sports Projects. I feel like I, I'd like to think I caught it early enough, but I made plenty of mistakes like all of us parents do. And I have a different perspective than I did seven, eight years ago. And I, I feel like all I'm trying to do, at my job as a parent, like I feel like my kids are on loan, are on loan to me. You know what I mean? They're like, mm -hmm. they're mine. They're on, they're mine, but my, I don't like, they're not mine for forever, right? They'll always be my kid, but I have to prepare them to go out and, 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 and teach their own kids one day or go help somebody else. So the only way to do that is to be experience the joys, experience the sadness, experience life. And there's no better teaching platform I have experienced than, than sport. And it's so easy though. It's so easy to get wrapped up into you talk about the financial commitments, the practices, you talked about it, the, the driving around from here to there. You know, I want my kid to start. I want them to get all these opportunities. Sometimes the best opportunities are not getting one. Right. You know, sometimes the best opportunities are, 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 are the ones that, that, that we don't qualify for, that we don't make. And then we find out when the rubber hits the road, what are we really made of? So I try to keep that in mind. And I find that I'm the best parent I can be, sports parent in particular, when I take my own expectations out of the equation try to teach to every single circumstance and not have these expectations because you know like, like everything else in life if we set our expectations too high i feel like we get let down we kind of miss the journey at least i know for me that the teaching points that come god knows i mean think about it two weeks ago we were supposed to record this and like something happens on my schedule so like when you're a parent things are constantly changing and if i don't right stay in the moment, I feel like I can ultimately end up, uh, you know, not taking advantage of everything. So that what is your, sense. yeah, what is your goal for the Reform Sports Project? I mean, are you looking to impact the way uh, youth sports are run in this country? Are you looking to impact the parental experience? Are you looking to impact the player experience, the coach experience, all of the above? It's a freaking awesome question. Um, and, and quite frankly, I'd say all of the above. Um, my goal with the Reform Sports Project is to be the platform that coaches, that parents, that kids, that everyone involved in the space goes to for information, for firsthand insight, for expertise, and not just from me or from you know some of our people that write uh, you know blogs and such. It's you know for interviews, for all different layers of content that can help parents and kids and coach navigate. The, the entire ecosystem, because that's what it is now. I mean, it's a $20 billion mm -hmm. industry. So, I mean, at the end of the day, and it's to give a fresh perspective of without any incentive. I think that's the, one of the biggest keys in understanding is when you look at the privatization of youth sports, I mean, what, what, and there's nothing wrong. Listen, I, I'm a, I love living in this country. I love that it's a capitalist country. I love that people can go out and make a living. Uh, but at the end of the day, every time you are out, everyone has an agenda right? Whatever that agenda is. And I would like the reform sports product to a certain degree to be kind of agnostic in that, to be a broker, if you will, of, of, of information. Um, and I think that, that when you step back and listen to all the coaches and, and all the folks I, I consider to be experts, you know, in this space, there's a lot of the similarities that are being said. Um, and I think that's for a reason, you know, I have yet to interview a coach in any sport I believe mean, like 500 of them who says it's a really, really good idea, you know, to specialize in one sport when you're seven years old. Like it, I highly recommend it. You know, again, is there a unique circumstance? Like if you're an unbelievable uh, figure skater or, you know, something along those lines where like you peak athletic performance at like 18, cause you're going to try to be an Olympian. Sure. You know, there's very, very, very small windows of that. But the point is, is that, to be able to be a place where coaches, kids, and parents can go to to get firsthand insight from those that, quite frankly, 
I think are at the highest levels and more importantly, don't have an agenda. Yeah. And you're coming at this, I mean, strictly from your own personal experiences, again, as first a player, then a coach, then a parent or parent, then coach. Um, and I mean, you, you have a life outside of youth sports. So I most, cer most certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> Just like I do. And this is, I, I, sometimes forget that I need to remind my audience that, you know, I'm just a parent like everybody else out there. I'm just somebody that, that wanted the best experience for my kid. And my goal has always been to finish this sports journey with my relationship with my kid intact. That's the goal. Whatever else happens with the sports, with school, with jobs, that all comes second to my relationship with my child. And I, I get that you come at this from the same perspective, Nick, that it's all about your relationship with your children and making sure that you're facilitating their goals and dreams without encroaching on that and, and putting your own goals and dreams in place of theirs. I think you nailed it. And, you know, you're, 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 I'm starting to feel get it, I'm starting to get fired up here because, you know, at the end of the day, some people look at sports and, you know, you, when you were bringing up as an athlete, as a parent, as a coach, and I'm like, I'm listening to you going, I'm, I mean, and I, this is one of the main reasons why I started it going back reform sports project is some people, this may come across wrong, but I think people will get the analogy. Some people look at church as their safe haven, right? I go to church and I, like I look at sports, I look at youth sports in particular, I think, man, like that's like my sanctuary. Like that's where I, if it wasn't for athletics for me, like I'm not going to college. Right. And and mm -hmm. like, I would never have, I didn't like school. I, I personally hated that. I just didn't like it, but I got a degree in four years. You know, it, it taught me discipline. It taught me to be competitive. It taught me, you know, all these things to overachieve, to get uncomfortable. I was very insecure when I was younger. And I had to work through a lot of things. Sports gave me confidence. It gave me so many things. And I feel like if there's one place that we should keep holy, it should be, you know, you know, if you're doing terrible and you're not enjoying school, you know, if you're, if you break up with your girlfriend, like you go out and you go out and you're with your team and you forget about it, you know, mm -hmm. that that's the way it makes me feel. And I can't stand how there's so much adult hands in the pot, stirring mm -hmm. it up and trying to suck the life out of it for these kids who, who quite frankly, a lot of kids, their lives get saved from sports. A lot of them get yeah. educations, a lot of them, you know, so for me and talking about being able to have an opportunity for my kids, like my son, Avery is going to go to college and wrestle. Well, my son, Tyler, who's a sophomore, he has absolutely no desire to play sports in college. He's a wrestler and lacrosse player, but you know what he wants to do because he had such a great youth sport experience and he loves being a part of like he wants to work in the MB, like for the NBA, like he, he wants to go UNC Charlotte so he can intern with the Charlotte Hornets and like work his way up to be a general manager one day. I got, that's the stuff that I love, like go be a part of something, use sports as an opportunity. And, and my daughter, she does track and field. She, she, she's never been competitive really in anything, halfway decent athlete. We told her you're doing something like you're not just going to sit around. She's fear, she, she had a tendency to be a little lazy. She all of a sudden now loves track. She's running the 400. She's doing pole vaulting. She's meeting all new friends. She's like excited, but like all these things that open up as a result of that experience. And, and that's why I'm so passionate about it because, uh, you know, I just seen it. I've lived it. Um, it's a healthy thing. And, and quite frankly, I, and, and that's why I want to make sure people understand, like, don't suck that joy out of it. Right. That, that's right. The like keep adults to adults and let the kids be kids and go have a good time. So one of the things that comes up quite often on Parenting Aces is the role of the parent in the junior development process. And for tennis, that often starts five, six, seven years old, goes through high school, then they go through college recruiting, and you know maybe they go and play college tennis. Some few go on to play on the pro tour and have professional tennis careers that way. But when I talk to coaches, there are certain coaches who feel like they want the parents there and engaged and involved in the process. And then other coaches who say, no, drop your kid off. Let me do my job 
and I'll keep you in the loop on what we're working on, but you be parent, I'll be coach. And this, you know, we'll all work together to help this child reach his or her goals. I guess from, you know, you come from more of a team aspect with baseball, but now you're seeing with your sons doing wrestling, more of the individual side too. It's very tricky to figure out what the role of the parent is supposed to be. I, I had a tennis match this morning and, and I kept getting distracted because there was a father and son pair on the court next to me. And the son was maybe 12 years old, really good player. And the dad just kept criticizing him after Mm. every point. And it was, it took everything in my being not to walk over and hand him my business card, but um, like, where do you see parents fitting in and how do you help coaches understand why the parent's role is so crucial and how to manage that? You know, uh, I think, well, I think there's a, there's a major, you asked about reform, you know, the, what are the long-term girls? There's a major education piece in it. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to think that the, that I, I, I get into that a lot with coaches and such on the podcast, but I mean, <clears throat> listen, from my experience <clears throat> as both a coach and, and parent, you know, communication is so key. And, and problem is at you're my time, new best friend, Nick, that, well, you know, the communication just, word. I mean, we use it all the time in this podcast. It's, it's crucial. I mean, you, you kind of just, you kind of just touched on a, a really interesting po- topic is that there are coaches that want to just say, I'm up here, you're down here, leave me alone. And then there's others that are, I feel like are, you know, the complete opposite. And that's why our hashtag and our, our, our kind of saying is restore balance. Like there, there's gotta be balance, right? Like, yeah. I, like it shouldn't be a dictatorship and it shouldn't be, you know, Oh, you know, we're bringing our kids, uh, you know, Kool-Aids and stuff in the dugouts and, and in between, like, there's gotta be, you gotta give kids the freedom to be able to be with their coach and have space. But, and I think a lot of it comes down to, I don't think all coaches do a very good job of communicating with parents, especially mm-hmm. at the youth level, um, whether that be via emails, I try to do that and I'm not perfect at it, but it's, it's creating open dialogue. And, and, and a lot of that yeah. comes from my, you know, from just experience, but I think it's, it's important to have the lines of communication open. The problem I've, you know, talked to people is once you open up that line of communication, not everyone feels comfortable setting boundaries. You know, not everyone, listen, I'm the coach, you're the parent. I understand that's your child, but if in order for this relationship to work, the the lines of communication have to be open, but also it's got to be understood that I am putting the best interest of your child as well as the team in, in place. And I'm not sure how it does with tennis, but it's like, we have to manage a parent's expectations and parents have to also keep an open mind to, to the fact that, Hey, in order for my kid to be able to have the best experience possible, I can't be up their rear end all the time. Like they gotta be, and I, I, they gotta be able to get some freedom. Like, especially, and I, I always, I say to parents, especially as the kids get older, it's like, do you want your, do you, do you expect your son or daughter Mainly it's been sons with me because I'm coaching boys. Like, do you think your son's going to play college sports? Yeah, great. What do you think that the college coach is going to want you like at practice all the time? Like, no, of course not. Well, you got to practice that right now. You got to give your kid the opportunity to be able to go out there and understand that this is his space. Like, it's okay to go to practice, especially when they're really young. I understand. I mean, I'm at my kids, but, but like, why do we got to stand at the fence? Mm. Why do we get to stand at the fence and like, like a hawk, you know, doing that? And some people will say, well, some coaches have no idea what they're doing. Man, we, I can go down a long rabbit hole. Here. Yeah, I understand. Are they well, being paid? Are they not? Right. Go ahead. But also, if you don't feel like the coach is doing their job, then find another coach. I mean, this is and I know that's easier said than done, especially in team sports and especially in areas that might not have a lot of sure. you know, choices. But the coach plays a huge role in your child's childhood and their experience in sport. So if you're, if you feel like the coach is not doing his or her job, then move on. Right. I mean, certainly. And, I, and, and I'm not sure how, I'm sure there's for you is in tennis. Is it more private instruction? Are you talking about that? Typically? I, that. I mean, typically. Yeah. But I mean, I'm even talking about in team sports because my kids all played team sports too, you know, before specializing in their various things. Sure. And you know, I, if, if I don't feel comfortable leaving my child in the hands of the coach, oh, because yeah. I don't 
feel like that coach is good at his or her job, then how's that experience going to be for my child or for me? It's not going to be a great experience. Couldn't agree with you more on that. If you're unhappy, if something's not right, and you're paying obviously dollars for it, um, then you probably need to take your business elsewhere. I mean, there's, you know, find the right fit for everyone. Absolutely. You know, but another thing I'll say is like, I'm coaching my kids Rex baseball. Like I'm talking they're eight and seven, you know, so, but, but sometimes you hear people say the coach doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, that coach is volunteering. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I also am a big advocate of like, find a way for there to be some sort of positive experience, like yes. find a way to tell your, and not for nothing, there's more coaching information on the internet now than, than that's ever been in the history of life. So like there are certain, certain amounts of tools that could be done. Like, don't be afraid to go coach yourself, especially in recreation sports. But I always say like, teach to the circumstance like your your kid may get to college and a coach leaves and then you got a new one and they got to learn how to deal with that like the cards are always going to be in their favor so how do i manage to that and i that's a great example of of something i try to really do it's it's like you know while skill specific stuff is extremely important um obviously i want my kids to learn if they're signing up for a sport whatever the sport it is, I want them to learn the basic fundamentals and learn how to get better at the skill. But I also want them to learn how to be great teammates. I also want them to learn how to be, you know, uh, how to be great citizens, how to have great energy enough. And sometimes a coach may be lackluster from a skill specific training, some standpoint, but he's teaching these kids to have great sportsmanship. Mm-hmm. He's teaching them to help one another. I mean, there's value in that. That translates to life. So it's almost like, let me step back Maybe this coach is a really nice guy and these kids are smiling and having fun. Wow. The other team may be more serious and having a lot more intensity and maybe winning more, but you know, my kids are having fun. Like there, there's something to be said about them having a good time. Again, we don't want it to be romper room and circus time and all that, but I mean, don't be afraid to look at it from a big picture and say, Hey, this person's giving up their time and they're, they are learning something. So I, perspective is also key and and obviously every situation is different. I love that. And I, that's a really important thing to point out. And in tennis, it is a little different because typically you're paying the coach. And so you, Mm -hmm. you expect the coach to have a certain body of knowledge and be able to communicate that knowledge effectively to the player, right? So that the player is getting better every day, but you know, there, there is that balance. And I love that you use that word of, making it enjoyable for the kid, not, as you said, not that it has to be circus time every day, but there is joy in getting better at something. There is joy at working hard and seeing improvement. There's joy in, you know, being thoroughly exhausted at the end of a lesson or the end of a workout or the end of a practice. And, you know, knowing that you left everything you had out there. So, joy doesn't necessarily just have to be giggles and, you know, running around and disorganized joy can come from all sorts of places. And I, I love what you said about taking that step back and looking for the joyful piece of it, you know, and I think a lot of us, especially if our kids are on that kind of elite level developmental path, we forget about the joy part. Well, it's so easy to, I mean, it's so easy to in this ultra competitive environment. And, you know, like for instance, my kid, my son, Avery, he, 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 we pay for him to go to a club and for a wrestling club. And yeah, of course, if that, if, if he wasn't getting the the type of training or the type of development that needed to be happening, well, then we got to go somewhere else. I mean, there's, there's, especially when you're paying for it, but at the end of the day, um, there's so much more. And I mean, tennis, obviously there's so much that go, but like, if I'm taking my kid for pitching lessons, I want the guy who's, or girl who's giving the lessons to have a clue of what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like that's a vital piece of the puzzle. I mean, uh, clearly, but you know, I think it's, I think it's, it gets lost, you know, it gets lost in today's ultra competitive. um, We're chasing everyone's, you know, chasing a scholarship and you know, that's the whole, and quite frankly, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I, I firmly believe, cause like my kid's getting a scholarship, but like, it's not a full ride. Like, right. it, but I, I also think there's, there's something cool that I think that there's like 
I think there's a little bit of ego that goes into oh, yeah. like a parent, a parent being able to say, Oh, my kid got a scout. Like, and I will tell you now that my, cause like where my kids going. And to you know what? That's like, okay, Nick. It's okay to feel that, right? You're proud of him. I totally, totally get that. Yeah. And I totally am proud of him. But I will tell you, like, they're like, but this, let's say the school costs 12 grand or 15 grand, whatever it is. You can get a scholarship. It's like a thousand dollars. You right. know what I mean? Like, but the perception is he's got a scholarship. Well, he's got like 500 bucks. You know, that there's <laughs> literally scholarships that are 500 bucks. Like, oh, so, yeah. but I mean, it's, it's, it, it doesn't have to be just for that. Like, I guess what I'm saying is, it, it, there's nothing wrong with being excited for your child having success. And there's nothing wrong with being proud of their achievements. God knows I am. But if all I do, and this is the trap, if all I am is focused on those, it, those, those performance-based things, and I don't take a step back and think about the full value that's being extracted from the entire sport experience. If I am only concerned about the medals, trophies, and victories, then I am setting myself up to be tremendously disappointed at some point. More importantly, I, I think I might have an opportunity to maybe sever the relationship I have with my kid because that expectation, that burden, whether they show it or not, they're feeling that internally and yeah. that pressure. I, I mean, and then and I put out a blog today about the car ride home, you know, about the car ride yeah. home. We um, talk about that a lot too. Yeah. It's a big that, thing in tennis. <laughs> <laughs> that is where I think the entire sport experience at times is either fostered and loved and developed, or it is torched in a blaze of fire. Yeah. Um, and so could the relationship with your child. So you got to yeah. watch your words, watch how you act. Yeah, there's a the kind of rule of thumb in tennis that you don't talk about the match for at least an hour and maybe two hours and only when the child brings it up you don't initiate the conversation as the parent, you let the child initiate the conversation. And we talk about that a lot. And, you know, there, I mean, you've seen the same studies I've seen, you know, all these former youth athletes are interviewed and, you know, what was your best experience in youth sports? What was your worst experience in youth sports? And the worst experience inevitably is that car ride home. And most of us mess that up royally. Most of us do, and it's okay. You know, you can admit to your child, hey, you know what? I did not handle that well yesterday. Yeah. Let let me let me try that again. And that's 100%. okay. Yeah. Hundred percent. And um and that's a good know, lesson like, for our kids to to learn too, is that we are not perfect as parents. Adults are not perfect. We mess up just like the kids do. And I tell my kids that all I know, and I I it's, it's such a great point. And I think, it, I think by admitting that, listen, it, what are we talking about? We're talking about vulnerability. You know, we're talking about the ability to get honest, the ability to, to let our walls down and to not act like we're, because kids, at least my kids, at least my kids, when they were younger, they, you know, they, they think that you're this, you know, that you're all this, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I remember looking back as a kid, you know, learning that my dad or my mom had flaws in some way. And, and especially when they take ownership to them, but you know, at the end of the day, when my child doesn't perform to the best of their ability um, or, you know, doesn't get the results that they want, the last thing they want to hear is me like, tell them about it. Yeah. You know, yeah. even at the youngest age, it's like, you know, and, but I will say this, like, I do hold my kids accountable to effort. I hold their accountability to, you know, if my son is an, is a jerk, after he loses a wrestling match, I don't care if it's two minutes or if it's 20 seconds, I'm going to let him know like, Hey, you need to, I don't care how mad you are. I need to clean that up. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm going to be, and to me, that's being a dad. That's and, right. And then that's, I think that's highly important. I don't think, I think matter of fact, I think if I wait too long that that message doesn't get pushed, but I mean, that's different than my kid didn't hit a single leg at the right time and, and get two points yeah. and score them. Like, he doesn't want to hear that from me because he probably knows him. Number one, him and his coach need to have that relationship, you know, and that's yeah. something that is so vital, especially as someone who is a coach, like I need to be dad first and I need to not be a coach at all when it comes to wrestling. So I don't really know anything about the sport. That's And that's another reason I love it because I could just be a total fan. Um, but they need to know I'm dad. I'm going to love them and hold them accountable to being a good human being and trying their hardest. But at the end of the day, if they don't 
you know, stand at the top of the podium. Um, I love him just the same. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Nick, how can people find your podcast, find your website and get more information about the great work you're doing? Well, I appreciate that, Lisa. We are at uh, www.reformsportsproject.com on Twitter at reform spot. So R E F O R M E D S P T P R O J, or you could just type in reform sports project. We're on Instagram. <laughs> We're on Facebook, and of course, we have the Reform Sports Project podcast, which every week we have a new episode, and we also uh, nine weeks ago uh, started the blog, so we're nine episodes, well, not nine, uh, nine blogs in. Um, check us out. Take a look at all, take a listen to our, I had some great coaches, had Dabo Sweeney on. Uh, I've had a lot of others that have been willing to come on, and we're going to keep doing that, so I appreciate you. Absolutely. And we'll have links to your website and to all your socials in the show notes on parentingaces.com. So if anybody is interested in following up with Nick, you can follow him through those links on parentingaces.com. Nick, it's been a pleasure meeting you finally, and uh, I, I will continue to follow your great work. I love the messages you put out. They're always so positive, so encouraging, and really you have provided a safe space for both parents and coaches, and I'm sure athletes too, but the, most of the stuff I've seen has been from the parent side or the coaching side to kind of come together and open those lines of communication. So thank you for that. Oh my God. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come chat with you. And thank you for the kind complimentary words. I love your work too. And I'm really grateful we connected. Me too. Thanks again. And to my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.